Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can check them out at filmmakeru.com. Every week, we post a video on Friday with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to ask questions. Today, I'm joined by Darian Schulman, composer for For Heaven's Sake, Trial by Media, and one of my personal favorites, American Vandal, among many others. Hi, Darian. Welcome to the show. Great to be here. Um, I guess my first question it would be when you're working with a a director, how do you get on the same page and, and understand what exactly they're looking for? Well, uh, uh, I was pretty lucky with American Vandals because uh, uh, the director, Tony Ascenda, and I have a pretty long standing uh, relationship. We go back several years. And so we have already developed a pretty common language uh, to um, for me to compose with. But um, this latest project, for heaven's sake, I was working with um, a director I hadn't worked with before, Tim uh, Johnson. And so it was a lot of um, <laughs> a lot of phone calls, a lot of uh, going back and forth, a lot of pre-composing so that I could um, really develop my, you know, my palette and um, my sound palette for, you know, for him. Um, so uh, it's, it's just communication is the most important thing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, my job as a composer is to really sort of serve the director's vision. Uh, so um, I really welcome any, you know, sort of ideas about, uh, you know, instrumentation or thematic material or really anything um, that, that he has to offer. Uh, now, how did how did you get into composing? Like, were you? Because I feel like <laughs> when I was in high school, not everyone was like, "I'm going to be a composer." <laughs> so, yeah. how did you make that decision? Um, I fell into it in college. Actually, uh, I had o sort of always um, kind of noodled around on um, the piano. I had like a an, one of those electronic uh, uh, synths, the really sort of cheap 90s versions like the Yamaha whatever that had the had like the backing tracks <laughs> um um but uh I was always sort of drawn to film scores um growing up I had a lot of John Williams and a lot of uh you know Jerry Goldsmith you know CDs and um in college I started to get more serious about it and um I just, uh, at a certain point, I just made a decision to kind of change majors and get into it uh, for real. Um, and uh, I didn't initially think it would be film composing that I would uh, pursue, but uh, <laughs> the uh, sort of more concert music oriented faculty constantly told me that my stuff sounded like film music. I don't think they meant it as a compliment, but uh, it sort of cued me in that, like, clued me in, I should say, uh, that uh, uh, this is something that I should um, pursue. Uh, when you when you worked on American Vandal, did you approach it as a documentary or did you approach it like a television show? Like, what was your, what was your working... Or your yeah. Approach for it. The 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 Van American Vandals is um. It's great because I you know we really tried to be as true true crime authentic as as possible. So I definitely approached the um. I approached composing for it as though I was composing for, you know, uh making a murderer or uh you know uh, uh jinx or one of those other uh one of those other you know docu series um it, it's i think the comedy really comes through when the you know sort of music is is not really in on the joke um mm -hmm. it, the music treats it as like really serious like this is this is <laughs> you know this is important stuff um so i mean i listen to a lot of like I, I listened to, uh, you know, the music from Serial. That was um, uh, an inspiration to me, Making a Murderer, as I said before. Like, 
um, all these, all these shows and, um, you know, podcasts and stuff that's it. The music is, I, I feel like it really, you know, it's important to really capture that, uh, you know, true crime, uh, feel and each of each one of these shows has its own sort of distinct, you know, personality mm -hmm. as far as the music goes. So, so yeah, I, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I was writing, you know, I was writing music for like the, the a drama and it ended up in a comedy, but I think it, it you know, I think it comes off. I, you know, it heightens, it heightens it for that reason. Oh, definitely. I think <laughs> you just, you go, you're like six episodes in, you're like, it's just, it's a picture of a dick. <laughs> I know. I know. And you get into it. I mean, that's yeah. what, like, a lot of people were kind of shocked at how into the story they were mm -hmm. by, like, the, you know, by the fourth or fifth episode. Um, well, it speaks a lot to how and this isn't i don't want this to come across like a negative thing but how manipulative those movies or shows are in terms of your emotions because you know oh we really need to care about this at this moment did oh yeah you, did you, how did you how did you walk that fine balance of not going over the top and really crazy manipulation and well we know? we we that i mean the show is a commentary on that kind of thing, right? So, I mean, both seasons, it's about, you know, how um, these, this genre really sort of exploits, not just like the audience, but the people who are the subjects of, of, uh, of these things. Um, so the goal, like in a, in a way, the goal was to manipulate people, mm -hmm. right? We, I wanted to make it as though um, I wanted to get the audience invested and I think, you know, that everyone, everyone did. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really not really, I mean, it's not walking a fine line. It's really going kind of whole hog into it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, how did, how did you do, so in, in approaching season two, what, what were your, what was different from season one? So season two, uh, it took place in a completely different setting with uh, a new, a completely new mystery. Um, so uh, the sort of the, the palette of the, the, the sound palette of the, uh, of the score had to change a little bit. And um, it was much more uh, into, it was much more about um, di like, uh social media and and sort of digital communications there's this um uh they called him the turd burglar he would do yeah. poop crimes um <laughs> um but uh he had he basically communicated with the world no one knows no one knew who he was via you know instagram mm -hmm. and so my score turned digital um a lot more synth based a lot more kind of um uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, arpeggiated stuff, um, mm -hmm. not, uh, not quite as organic, uh, you know, I sort of tried to stay away from like the, you know, like guitars and, and sort of more, uh, you know, more organic instruments. Um, so that's, that's basically the difference. I mean, I kept the main sort of melodies and themes, um, but, you know, I sort of re retooled them for season two when, is, when you said sorry go ahead well i was gonna say when you said talked about the guitars i can't help but think uh when i when i was studying film years ago um the they got a copy of um dr caligari cabinet of dr caligari but i guess in the 80s or the 70s and the 80s they did like acid versions Oh, so it was like a weird, like Jimi Hendrix guitar solo through the whole thing, <laughs> and everything was like changing colors. <laughs> and the prof was like, it's "The only copy we could get." <laughs> he's like, "So please ignore the colors and the music." <laughs> it was just the weirdest thing to just sit there and be like, "What are we watching?" 
<laughs> that sounds awesome. I want to I want to see yeah. that actually. There's apparently there was like a whole series of like black and white movies that they did that way. Oh wow. So yeah. Um how do you start a project? What is your approach to getting I guess like you sit down at the piano or sit down with your guitar or whatever instrument you prefer? How do you start? Like where do, where do you go? Um the first thing I do is sort of request whatever uh, like visual elements I can get from the director and or editor. So if they, you know, any, like, even if it's just screen caps of like dailies, um, uh, that inspires me. Um, so once I'm looking at that, you know, I'll part, I sort of, sometimes I'll even make like a little slideshow that I'll just sort of play in my, you know, play on, on kind of a loop in my, in my DAW. And, um, and, uh, then I just start to noodle on my keyboard and I start playing with, you know, different, different sounds, different melodies. Uh, it's very improvisatory and, um, it is, uh, it's the kind of thing where I, you know, as again, as I said before, like I, I really like, you know, a second pair of ears. So I will maybe write a 90 second or two minute thing, right? Like that, you know, is maybe it's, you know, in very like kind of rough shape or whatever, but then I'll send it to the director. I'll just say like, what do you think of this melody for this character or this subject matter you know this theme um and uh it's the back and forth of it is how i you know sort of develop the sort of sound world that i want the score to be how do you like so this is probably more of a question for editors because a lot of editors will be like okay i'm going to put in the temp music or mm -hmm. what have you and a lot of young editors when they're starting out struggle to find the right point to start to put in the music right because it's yeah just, like how do you find the right moment to start the music what is was your approach with assessing the footage and getting it in um you mean like in a in you know if i get an episode if i get a cut yeah, yeah. and that like tent music is in there or or without you know. the tent music let's say i like mean it, I, it's rare that i get stuff without any sort of music uh whether it's temp or or not so like uh with for heaven's sake i was working there was a lot of temp music in there um so the first thing i'll do is like watch it down with the temp music make some notes about like what you know obviously what the editor thought <laughs> like mm -hmm. um because i value that uh uh and then i'll you know I'll mute it. I'll mute the temp music. They, they send it to me with, you know, fully, uh, you know, stereo pan. Mm -hmm. So music on the right hand side and dialogue and sound effects on the left hand side. Yeah. Which means I get to mute one of them if I want to. So I'll, then I'll, you know, once I'm done with watching it down, I'll watch it down again without any sort of music and I'll make another series of notes about what I, what I think. Um, as far as when you know in a specific scene when i think music should come in it's based almost entirely on what's going on right so if there's a if there's a big reveal like uh that kind of thing you know there you know i'll i'll say there there needs to be something there it's also i also spot it with the director as well like once i'm done with the sort of process of watching it down myself we with for heaven's sake uh tim and i got on zoom and um i actually used uh uh this plugin called audio audio movers so that i could basically pipe the output of logic pro into the zoom session which meant i could sort of you know improvise ideas in front of him as though we were sort of in the same room mm -hmm. um and so uh that's, uh, you know, at the end of the spotting session, that is when the sort of 
the real decisions about what you know when music comes in and when it is you know silent um uh but you know i mean it's different for every episode so it's like i almost need a specific example uh to talk about um let me think um <laughs> well i guess I, well one of my questions that comes from what you were just saying is you know yeah. the temp music comes to you a lot how do you deal with temp love because i know yeah uh a lot of when i talk to mixers a lot of their frustration is dealing with temp love of the sound effects or sound designers they'll get like some of the sound effects are temped in one thing that i will often request is that once i start my process of composing that the um that the director try to watch it down a few times without any sort of temp music because i want to sort of cleanse his <laughs> cleanse his or her palate do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, the, a lot of temp love comes from just being used to hearing something one way. And then when you hear, you know, when, when you hear my score, I don't want it colored by the sort of jarring effect of being used to one thing. And then like something new comes in and you, 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 the ears have to sort of get used to that first before they can really make an assessment of like whether they think what I'm doing is working or not. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, sometimes the, the style or sound of the temp that they pick is pretty close to what I would have done. Um, and, uh, you know, in those cases, I consider myself kind of lucky. So I just like, you know, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm copying the temp music, but I am, you know, composing something in a sort of similar vein. So it's, you know, those, those, uh, situations, you know, temp, temp love isn't really as much of an issue, but when I want to do something that really is a departure, uh, then I need, you know, uh, I need, I, I, I tend to ask the director to, um, you know, listen with fresh ears, uh, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, <laughs> but you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a, pro you know, it's a process and it's a back and forth. Um, and then I want to, you know, the other thing I want to say about that, uh, is that I, I, if there's, I really try to, if there's like temp love going on, I really try to drill down with the director or the editor, like, what is it about this that you are drawn to? Like what aspect of this? Is it the instrumentation? Is it the melody? Is it the, the, you know, tempo? Um, you know, and I try not to use like too much. I mean, I, I try not to use te technical language, but uh, you know, because I, I, you know, a lot of directors aren't musicians at all. So, um, but if I can get the um, if I can get the director to sort of think about and then sort of enunciate what it is that they like about the, uh, the, the temp that sort of informs, um, my process in terms of composing for like, uh, in terms of, um, trying to capture that with whatever I, whatever I write. Now, is there a particular scene or, um, you know, I guess, well, I guess a particular part of a movie that you've, uh, you found extremely challenging and, and how did you tackle that from a composing pr perspective? It's a good question. Uh, there are in American Vandal, um, there's a scene in the last episode where, uh, the main character Dylan is basically watching essentially the first episode it's very meta mm -hmm. and the score from the first episode is a sort of playing on screen and there's this moment where dylan realizes what his peers really think of him and so the challenge for me was 
trying to create some kind of underscore for that while the other like while the old music was playing at the same time so uh just sort of going into like charles ives territory there you know yeah. um uh and so you know what i ended up doing was basically just sort of introducing like a very low sort of sub bass sound to that mm -hmm. um that's the thing that uh you know that's the thing that comes to mind um right away the the you know as far as like um uh, you know challenging uh anything where there's a lot of um background noise or 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 music that you know is already in there that can't be um that can't be taken out having to compose around that i find to be the most where do you go for inspiration i guess you know it it, it really it really depends on on the day i mean <laughs> um and it really depends on the project um for with for heaven's sake for heaven's sake takes place uh in rural ontario um, most of it is in the dead of winter so um when i was starting out i was trying to you know sort of research like what was you know and uh, what was canadian folk music like in the uh, you know <laughs> must have been a fun journey 1930s. yeah i mean you know you go on youtube and you can find this stuff yeah. um so uh because the most of uh, the, the show sort of is about this cold case that happened in the early 30s mm -hmm. in 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 uh, a town called um minden minden ontario yeah. and um so um you know, I tr trying to sort of capture the sort of, you know, the sound, a little bit of the sound of, or at least hint at a little bit of the sound of, you know, um, Canadian, like, uh, you know, music that was sort of popular at the time. Um, and also capturing the sound of winter, the sound, of, like the, the sort of feel of like coldness of sort of desolate snow, ice, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh if you're asking me like uh you know what are my sort of composer influences um it is anyone from copeland's to um michael giacchino like uh, uh it's it's a very you know wide range of <laughs> of people so i you know yeah. i just uh, try to i just try to keep as sort of broad a spectrum of stuff that I listen to um, as possible. Um, when you were searching out Canadian folk music, did you come across the, uh, I think it's called the Lumberjack Waltz or the Logger Waltz? I, 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 it, that sounds familiar. You know, the thing about For Heaven's <laughs> Sake is that I started that project at the beginning of the pandemic. So yeah. all the res all the sort of pre re re like the research uh, that I did, you know, pre composing, that was all that was all like a year ago, and so yeah. composing during the uh, composing pandemic composing is something of a challenge too. <laughs> um, so we had you know the we had the shutdown and um, you know production got delayed and so. There was a lot of waiting and uh you know a lot of composing and recomposing and uh, so it was uh it was an interesting process my other question for that is because when i think of cold and when i've been in areas where there's not many people around uh the thing about winters is it tends to be a lack of sound almost yeah right like everything's just quiet yeah. How do you compose music for something like that? Um, it's a lot of, uh, it's, a, you know, tempo is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And keeping it, I try to keep it very sparse. So if I have just sort of, if a cue is just two chords that are like 10 seconds apart on the piano, um, 
you know, maybe with like some uh, reverb and delay effects on it. That is the kind of thing that um, to me conveys, you know, the sort of stillness, mm -hmm. the austere, uh, you know, remote, desolate uh, sound. Yeah. That's what works for me. Um, okay. And and how do you make it feel cold? Because you said <laughs> I don't like oh, getting the, the feeling cold. To, to me, that's like um, that's a timbre thing. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of um, you know bells, um, a lot of you know sort of harp sound, uh, harp harp sounds. And again, it's like if you can treat the sound. I found a. Um, <laughs> I found a, uh, uh, and, uh, what they call a, a music maker. It's a child's instrument in my parents' mm -hmm. basement. I guess I had it when I was a kid. Um, I dug that out and, uh, sampled that, mm -hmm. um, just like literally like plucking each string at a time and waiting 10 seconds. And so I created a sample instrument, send that through um, an amplifier and like some very, very long, uh, you know, plate reverbs and stuff like that. I, I said, <laughs> I sent, a, a um, you know, a, a 30 second, uh, you know, melody of that to the director. And I said, does this sound cold to you? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... <laughs> And then you were like, does it sound Canadian? And yeah, right, right. I was like, does this yeah. sound like rural Ontario <laughs> in January in 1933? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I have one last question that I like to ask everyone I'm interviewing during the pandemic. We've been stuck inside, you know, you've got your second uh, vaccine shot, so you could probably go outside now. Yes. <laughs> um what do you recommend for those stuck inside on the streaming service? Cause we all started watching it almost collectively. Is there something you discovered that they need to check out? Uh, for heaven's sake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, man. Uh, yeah, it's, that is, that is a good question. It's I feel like, it, you know, besides, you know, working, which I've been lucky enough to have, like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I've been what just watching streaming, uh, streaming stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I have uh, I have been enjoying um, uh, this show Invincible on uh, oh yeah Amazon just, Prime. Just, yeah. yeah, just started it. I mean, I just finished episode two last night. Yeah, it's that's. I think that's all. That show is a lot of fun and well yeah. done. Did you read the comic um, before? Or? I didn't. I didn't even know it was a comic until uh, 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 recently. But I'm going to check that out. I would say I almost feel like it's good that you didn't read the comic because I was like, oh, I better read the comic before I watch this. Yeah. And then now I'm watching it. And I'm like, why did they change that? Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're. I will say that at least what I've seen in the first two episodes they've rearranged things and they've done things in drastically different ways. And that's mm -hmm. not bad. It's actually really good the way they did yeah. it. It's just, it's pulls you out for a second when you've read the original piece. You had, uh, you had temp love in a way. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> that was the thing. It wasn't that I had temp love. It was just that I was like, now why would they make that choice? Right. What was the thought process behind that. Cause like they, you know, amount like there was one where they amalgamated, you know, in the, I think it's in episode two where the aliens come and they keep getting older. Yes. Too yeah. fast. Mm -hmm. That's spread out over like multiple books. So it's like, it happens oh. in book, let's say two, and then 12 books later, it happens again. And that is interesting. All this other stuff. And I was like, okay, well that makes sense because you know, you're trying to tell a, com a complete story here of his arc here. And that kind of makes sense. But yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder why, <laughs> what the thought process was. <laughs> So it's, it's, so it's weird. Cause it's really good. Yeah. But then at the same time, I'm like stopping myself. I'm like, I gotta right. stop thinking about it. So I guess I'll try to yeah. reverse that where, you know, I'll, I'll get through yeah. this first season and then I'll read the books and then yeah. maybe I'll 
maybe I'll be able to, we'll reconvene and we can, you know, <laughs> yeah, discuss <exactly>. that. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Oh, it was a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Hope to do it again soon. Yeah. And if you're in Toronto, Canada, not rural, but uh, we can always grab a coffee. Now oh, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, definitely.